Hi everyone, it's Liam here from A Shot of Wildlife. In this video, I'm going to tell you the story of a recent trip to Cumbria where I managed to see and film lots of wildlife and landscape that I've never featured on this channel before. So let's get cracking. My journey started in the flat farmlands of Norfolk, but as I made the near 300 mile trip northwest, the landscape became hilly and wild. After taking a quick look at my home for the weekend, I started searching for wildlife. It didn't take long and I didn't have to go very far. In a beck running through the site, I managed to film a dipper for the first time ever. Dippers are about the same size as a blackbird, but they have a very different lifestyle. Their diet is made up of invertebrates and small fish that they get from underneath the surface of fast flowing streams and rivers. They are capable of swimming and can literally walk under the water, but this first one was sticking to the shallows and repeatedly dipping its head under the surface. Soon, another species often associated with streams turned up, a grey wagtail. Like their more common cousin, the pied wagtail, these are mostly insectivorous and spend a lot of their time along the water's edge, sometimes jumping into the air to catch flying insects as they pass by. This one had taken a note out of the dipper's book and seemed to be looking under the water for food. There were several brown trout here too. A bit later on in my trip, I did try to film them underwater, but you'll have to stick around to see how I got on with that. As the sun began to set on my first night in Cumbria, I took in the scenery and may have got a little bit excited whilst using the facilities. And sometimes you really have to slum it with this wildlife stuff. <laughs> the next morning, it was an early rise. Time for a quick cup of coffee and then I was off to see what other wildlife Cumbria would show me. I travelled around three miles south to a large body of water called Talkin Tarn. I've made it to Talkin Tarn. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that right, but if I'm not, somebody will correct me in the comments. Um, and so far I've seen the likely suspects, I've seen some mallards, a couple of swans, a moorhen and some tufted ducks. But this is just the first path from the car park. The place is massive, I'm going to take the drone up in a moment and show you just how big it is. And then I'm going to start doing a circular route and see if I can find some more interesting wildlife to show you. Before I got going, I took the opportunity to get a bit of footage of this moorhen. Despite them being quite common across most of the country, one thing I've learned from my wildlife trips away is to never overlook filming the common species. A dog walker had just flicked out some seas into the shallows and a small flock of mallards had came to hoover them up. The tufted ducks were much more timid though and would barely come within 20 metres whilst I was stood there. I left them to it and walked far enough away as to not disturb them and then got my drone into the air. Talking time was formed around 18,000 years ago by moving glaciers and is around 15 metres deep in the middle. Apparently it's home to some large perch and pike but I had no chance of seeing these from the air so I continued making my way around the water. A flock of mute swans had gathered in a shallow area. These birds would most probably have been away from the tarn throughout the summer when they can be really territorial towards one another, but throughout the colder months they often gather in larger groups, especially in areas with open water and reliable sources of food. As I carried on, I felt sorry for the person who'd have to live in this tiny house with such a terrible view before spotting a flock of starlings among some nearby bushes. 
From a distance, these can look plainly coloured, but up close they are quite beautiful. They have declined significantly in the UK in recent years, but are an invasive species and are treated as a pest in some other countries. On the far bank, I could see a grey heron. This bird, with its dull markings and lack of any head plumes, is a young bird, but something must have spooked it as it soon took to the air and out of sight. Up ahead of me, another dog walker had scattered some more seeds in the shallows, which had attracted quite a variety of waterfowl, including this family of mute swans with their two well-grown cygnets. What seemed like all of the mallards on the tarn had flown in for the feast, but they brought with them a surprisingly confident tufted duck. With its brown overall colouring, this one is a female, and this is the closest I've ever been to one. Usually, they'll stay out in the deeper water, sometimes diving to more than 14 metres deep to find food, but I can't blame this one for taking advantage of these easy pickings. Further out on the water was a family of Canada geese. These birds were first introduced to London in the 17th century, but are now found across pretty much the whole of the UK. They often form noisy flocks of several pairs and their young, which is what I suspect there was here, although teenage birds are hard to separate from adults at a distance. I carried on around the water, passing by a fallen tree that looked like it could have been there for as long as the tarn itself. Just beyond it was a single moorhen and a small raft of coots. These are black over most of their bodies, but they have a white lump known as a frontal shield at the base of their beaks. The size and colour of this can often indicate how old and how healthy each bird is. Well, I have to say, this is a bit different from the bird observatories back home. They're more sheds on stilts and that sort of thing. This one, solid brick, and it looks like it's been here for a very long time. And it gives a pretty good view across the water as well. Despite the view, the only wildlife I could see from the hide was this pair of little grebes. The bird on the right is an adult, whilst the other is a youngster. Like their cousins the great crested grebe, little grebes have a varied nesting season and can lay eggs as late as September. I left the hide and passed a quiet, bird-free patch of water before the path took me into a woodland where I met this characteristically bold robin sitting next to the path. Robins are usually described as having a red breast but it's actually orange, it's just there wasn't a word for this colour in English until the 16th century, so the name Robin Redbreast has stuck. Further down the path I noticed some movement out in the water. It was natural, but not alive. An underwater spring flowing into the tarn. I don't know enough to say where this water comes from, but it was quite interesting to see. From here, it was a short walk to the car park, but that doesn't mean there was no more wildlife to be found. Someone had placed some bird seeds on a few rocks that aligned the car park, and all manner of creatures had came to take advantage of it. On the first rock was a small flock of chaffinches. Most of these are male, with their orange markings, but you can just about see that the bird in the middle is a female with her less colourful feathers. On another rock, a female mallard had made the climb up for some seeds, and on a third was this flock of starlings and a rotund wood pigeon. And on the final rock, this male mallard had been joined by a European rabbit. I'm back at the car now, and it was great to walk around there, beautiful morning, but now I'm starving hungry, so it's time to head back to the glamping site for some breakfast. The site where I was staying is managed by Wigwam Holidays, 
who I've been working with recently on a video series that they're making about people who enjoy the outside. Each cabin has its own TV, table and chairs and a mini kitchen, including fridge, microwave, kettle, toaster and two hobs. There was an ensuite bathroom with a shower, a heated towel rail and of course a toilet. In the room there was a double bed and a sofa that also pulls out into a second double bed if needed. The outside space included a fire pit with stools, a fence decking area and a wood fired hot tub which got a lot of use during my stay. On site there is also a cafe, a fishing shop and two trout fishing lakes with fly fishing lessons available if you want. I did get my stay for free but I would never recommend something to you that I didn't genuinely like so if glamping is your thing consider Wigwam Holidays. They've got over 80 locations in the UK and there'll be a link to their website in the description. And now back to the wildlife. I've just made it to Gelt Woods, or what I think is Gelt Woods, it isn't very well signposted and I'm not sure what way exactly I've got to go. I also have no idea what sort of wildlife I'm going to find if any, but I'm going to have a look around and if I see something I will show it to you. I had parked underneath a cool looking viaduct and after actually having a look it turns out there was a sign and I was in the correct place. The path follows the course of the River Gelt and it wasn't long before I spotted my first animal, another dipper. They have specially adapted flaps of skin over their nostrils to prevent water from gushing in when they repeatedly stick their heads underneath. This one was much less used to people than the one at the glamping site and once it saw me it disappeared upstream. I carried on along the path where among the early autumn leaf litter and decaying tree stumps, I noticed this patch of unidentified fungi. I then came to an area where the bare rock faces looked as if they had been eroded, just like those at the river's edge, but this was actually man-made. The next stretch of the route rose up into the valley, where in a woodland next to the path, I saw these mushrooms growing. Now this is a species that I can identify, the fly agaric. Apparently it's been a very good year for what is often looked at as the fairy tale mushroom and I have to agree, I've seen lots of them in recent weeks. Nearby this stinkhorn fungus was growing. They smell like rotting flesh and for some reason the Victorians used to go out and flatten them in the mornings as they were worried that some people might be embarrassed if they saw them. Further along the route, the woodland opened up and there were signs that this area used to be used much more by people, and that is correct. The steep sides of this area of the valley are part of a quarry from 1900 years ago when the Romans excavated stone from here to build Hadrian's Wall. Since my visit, I've found that Gelt Woods is one of a handful of sites in the UK where Roman inscriptions can still be found in the rockwork. I stopped shortly after this for a drink and a snack and whilst rested I made what I would call my bravest drone flight to date. I think it was worth it but I'm not sure I'd be saying that if my drone had taken an unexpected swim. From here I turned back and as I made my way I noticed this small mammal in the middle of the path. This is a wood mouse and an unwell one at that. They wouldn't usually be out in the open like this, especially during the daytime when there were lots of potential predators about but it soon became clear that this one had lost the proper use of its back legs. I very much doubt it survived for much longer after I saw it. As I almost made it back to where I'd parked my car, I once again got a distant view of a familiar bird. This one was demonstrating why they are called dippers, by bobbing its body up and down repeatedly. 
It's thought that this constant movement is a way of them communicating to one another instead of trying to call out over the sound of the running water which usually surrounds them. And then, my time at Gelt Woods was over. I'm back at the glamping site now, and as you may be able to hear, the weather has taken a bit of a turn. It's about to rain, I think, um, and there's a few hours until it gets dark. So I'm gonna take a look inside the stream, and you are currently a waterproof camera. So you're gonna take a look beneath the surface, and hopefully we'll film some fish or maybe some invertebrates and stuff, I guess. If I'm in a stream, it doesn't really matter if I get wet, does it? Well, I'd completely underestimated how cold the stream would be, so sorry about the shakiness of this footage. The water was so cold I could barely keep hold of the camera, but hopefully you can just about make out these small, free-spine sticklebacks. These are one of the most widely distributed fish in the UK, but I was quite surprised to see how well they held their positions in the fast flowing current of the stream, having only seen them in almost still water before. I couldn't keep my hand in the water for long, and whilst doing so, I noticed there was a trout swimming slightly further downstream. Surely, this is my chance to finally get some decent underwater footage of one. I waited until it moved away, and with the stealth of a scaffold lorry going over a speed bump, I positioned the camera in a slow flowing area of the stream. Well good luck, and don't come back until you film a trout underwater, okay? I knew it could take some time for the fish to come back, so in the meantime I had a look around and surprise, surprise, another dipper was sitting upstream on a rock. There are less than 19,000 pairs of these birds in the UK, and they are absent from most of central and eastern England. I went back to check on the underwater camera, and things were looking good, so after a few more minutes, I waded in to see what I'd managed to film. Success. I know this isn't going to win any awards, but I've been wanting to film a trout underwater for years, so this is a great start. Brown trout are the most genetically diverse vertebrate on the planet and were once classified as more than 50 different species. This one stayed for around 30 seconds and then moved out of view of the camera. I headed back to my wigwam where the weather went from drizzly to full on raining. I decided to spend that evening in the nearby town of Brampton and after a nice dinner and some drinks at one of the local pubs, which I didn't film, I came back and called it a night. The following morning, after packing away my stuff, there was only one thing left to do. Collect and check a couple of camera traps that the site's owner had been kind enough to let me set up along a private stretch of the stream. In order to do so, I had to pass through a field where they kept their free alpacas. Unfortunately, the audio file here got corrupted, but I can guarantee what I was saying was an equal measure of funny, intelligent and witty and had absolutely nothing to do with me being intimidated by these fluffy, donkey-sized puppy brains. One of the camera traps pointed out towards a larger pool area of the stream, and another was placed further downstream towards some rocks. I won't lie, I was really hoping to film an otter or some other mammal, but on the first camera, aside from several times when it was triggered with nothing in sight, the only thing it filmed was a grey heron walking by. The second camera also managed to film a grey heron, this time stalking through the shallows in the daylight. And here in the early morning, having what looked like a successful strike at a small fish or invertebrate. 
The only other time the camera triggered was with a heron right close in, but what's interesting is the movement in the water. A large fish gets spooked and dashes away. I am guessing here, but I would say from the size and from the way it moved that this would have been a pike, but it could have also been a very large trout, I suppose. And on that note, it's time for me to leave and head back to Flat Old Norfolk. Um, if you ever are considering a glamping trip away to see wildlife in a wild place like this, it's beautiful. I can really highly recommend it. Um, and there will be a link for Wigwam Holidays down below. If you enjoyed this sort of video and you want to see more British wildlife videos, then check out this one was on the screen. Subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.